Hi there, Taylor Hemnes here from KSHB 41 for another edition of Faith in KC. Coming to you from Kauffman Stadium. It's rare that I get to take in a day game here on a weekday. Came over to watch as I'm recording this. This is uh, Royals-Astros game four uh, this week. Uh, Royals going for the sweep today and cool to be out here uh, for a day game. Um, don't want to have a long intro today because I've, it's a long episode and the reason I'm coming to you here is because my guest for this month is Dayton Moore. This is the last full month of summer and it just felt like a good time to talk a little baseball and Dayton Moore has been GM for the Royals, something good just happened, uh, for the last 14 years and he um, he's very public about his faith and I wanted to ask him about it and have a great conversation. He's got a lot of interesting insight and things to say about his job in professional sports and how he juggles that with his faith and I hope you'll enjoy it. As always, reach out to me uh, on social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. You can find me or you can email me at taylor.hymnus at kshb.com. But for now, enjoy this next edition of Faith in KC. So I'm so thrilled to be joined today by Dayton Moore, General Manager for the Kansas City Royals. Uh, Dayton, thank you for your time this morning. I know you're a busy guy as we record this. We just got through with the uh, trade deadline last week. So it's a very busy time of the season for you. So I appreciate you taking some time. Absolutely, Taylor. Great to be with you. So let me ask you this. Uh, I know you were you were raised in Illinois, right? And you were born in Kansas, but raised in Illinois. Is that right? I went to high school in Illinois. Yeah, I was there okay. for four years and and actually um, was uh, was born in Wichita. My mom, yeah. and my mother and father uh, grew up in that part of the world. And um, uh, but my dad got out of the service. Um, he took a job actually with Beechcraft right there in Wichita. And then um, as he uh, attempted to better our lives. We, we bounced around quite a bit, lived in Florida, Memphis, Tennessee, um, uh, Illinois, as I said, and then uh, Virginia. That's where my wife and I met in Virginia. And, and so it's, it's been a fun journey. Was church part of growing up for you? Did you ever, and all those places where you always looking, where are we going to go to church? Was that part of the discussion? Faith, faith was, um, was a big part of our family. Uh, I wouldn't say it was uh, as consistent as it, it probably could have been. Um, again, my father traveled a lot. Uh, he was very consumed with his work. He was definitely the spiritual leader of our family. When he was home and when he was around, uh, most of the time, you know, we would be in church. Um, you know, as my mother was uh, raising three young people and uh, young kids, and, and she worked outside the home. At, uh, at periods of time is, uh, you know, it, and it was kind of uh, out of the norm at that period of time. Uh, very few women did work outside the home and, and right. mom took jobs, uh, you know, uh, hourly jobs, minimum wage type jobs, but it was what was required uh, to support our family. And so, as we all know and understand and appreciate, um, when families are busy, when uh there's uh, uh, a lot of things going on outside the home uh, and sometimes of the, uh, the really, really important things like family dinners and, and being in church together, whether it be on Sundays or Wednesday nights or being a part of youth groups or youth camps or mission trips. And, you know, some of those things get neglected because of the busyness of, of our lives. Uh, you know, I just know that... <clears throat> as I reflect back on how Marianne and I raised our children. I mean, uh, I'm thankful for everything that we went through and Marianne uh, and I made an advanced decision before we actually got married that, that she was going to stay home with the children. Uh, and I know how difficult that was um, in raising our children and the strain that that put on us with her being in their lives every single day. So I've got great respect for, for, um, uh, you know, parents that uh, when both parents work and, and again, some of the strain that uh, yeah. put on families, but when I reflect back, I mean, there's some things that, that we would have done different. Uh, you know, we would have made sure that we spent more time around the dinner table, uh, not letting the uh, demands and the activities of our children really interfere with our family time and our togetherness. Uh, I would have made sure that, uh, you know, we, we didn't miss, you know, some of those, those things because we were scattered a lot uh, yeah. growing up, you know, with our kids. So what's the first, I, I'm sure you grew up playing sports. What's, what's the first memory that you can think of, of faith and sports intersecting a, a prayer before a baseball game with the team or something like that. Do you, do you remember a time where 
it stuck out to you that this is the first time that these two these two paths have intersected? Yeah, probably more so when I was uh, when I went to junior college um, in in Garden City, Kansas. Uh, as I said, I, I graduated from high school in Illinois. Um, I was actually going to go to the University of Missouri at Columbia, um, and uh, a scout by the name of Larry Smith uh, uh, saw me at a tryout camp, and he asked me if I'd be willing to go to a junior college uh, where he felt I would develop a lot better. Uh, I decided to do it, and then being away from from home, uh, involved with a community of, of young players that were all away from home. I think my faith became more real to me then, uh, being involved in Bible studies, and we had several players that were uh, living their faith, and um, you know, I, I joined in. Live, living and working in professional sports as you do, and and being in sports all your life, can you can you put a a descriptor? Can you put your finger on where you think? Just overall, and obviously there's a lot of faiths out there and a lot of faiths represented in sports, but where where you see people being able to carry both those things, the people that you've been around in sports that are people of faith that also happen to work in professional sports, how, how do you see most of those people carrying both of those things? Well, I think, it's, uh, I think the most important thing is to be transparent uh, about what you're dealing with, what you're experiencing. Uh, we're human beings. We're going to make mistakes. Uh, the stresses of the day-to-day -day life uh, are going to bring out uh, ingredients in us that uh, we wish weren't there. We wish were not a part of our human condition. Uh, and so when you do make mistakes, uh, you need to, um, again, be transparent about it. Uh, ask for forgiveness. Uh, the, the individuals that I believe uh, are most successful on a day-in and day-out basis uh, can practice that daily forgiveness uh, because there's always somebody looking at us uh, in a very critical way. Uh, they're, they're judging us in ways we wish uh, were not there. Uh, I've learned that people are looking at us really in one of two ways every single day. They're looking at us with a critical eye or a critical spirit. And thank God for those people that are looking at us with a critical eye. They can help us uh, you know, they mold us, they shape us, they uncover blind spots, they speak truth into our lives. We need those individuals that are going to tell us the truth and, again, help shape us and mold us and, and uncover blind spots. And then there is an overwhelming group that are looking at us with a critical spirit. And no matter what we do or what we say, uh, it's never going to be good enough. Uh, when we are outspoken about our faith and we do uh, make mistakes, they're quick to really criticize us and and uh, uh, make us feel unworthy of, of, of our faith. And uh, again, we can never do right by them. And I've learned to just give that away. I'm not trying to please them. I can't please them. Uh, I've learned to uh, just pray about it, give it away. Uh, and again, it helps me practice that daily forgiveness. And Taylor, let me say this. I, I've been in baseball my entire life. I can never recall a day where I haven't thought or dreamt about this game since I was a little boy. Um, but I can honestly tell you, almost every single year, I go through periods of time where I feel burnout. I start questioning if this is really something that I want to continue to do. Um, it, uh, it frustrates me. And when I trace it back to why I feel the way I feel during that period of time, it always goes back to the forgiveness piece. It always goes back to a relationship that I need to mend, something I need to give away, some burden or weight that I'm carrying unnecessarily. Um, and it goes back to, again, that forgiveness piece and that critical eye and critical spirit. And I'm, I'm letting the demands and the expectations of what man wants me to be interfere with who God wants me to be and the, uh, the great path in life he has for me and my family. And so it's all about keeping those, those things in perspective. And my faith allows me to, to manage through that. But you, you ask a question about how people do it. Everybody does it a little differently. That's just kind of my leadership style with it. I've always felt you might as well be transparent in life because you're going to get exposed anyway. Um, you need to be able to talk about uh, your hurts, 
you need to be able to talk openly about your mistakes because really the mistakes that I've made is, and I'm thankful for them. I've learned so much more from my mistakes than, than our successes. And um, the mistakes I've made is really all I have to offer others. And, um, you know, again, to be able to talk about it uh, and be humble about it uh, is, is really what makes this, this life worth living and this journey so fulfilling. Uh, and there's great freedom in that. I don't mean for this to be an indictment of my level of research to get ready for this interview, but I, I'm going to say it anyway. I'm looking at your Wikipedia page here, and under personal life, the first thing it says is, Moore is a Christian and is open about his spiritual beliefs. Um, before, I, I've been in Kansas State for about four years, and I think I heard that about you before I met you. Uh, and I, this is the second or third time you and I have spoken. What is it? What does it mean to you that people know you for that, both in and out of baseball, that just that, that this is a, a thing about Dayton Moore that people know? Well, Ted, I would say this. I'm a, to be a good leader, I think you need to be a great follower. And you've got to follow something that you believe in. And I, I'm a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, that's, that's been uh, the leader that I have admired most. Why? Uh, because he looks at things... He came to this earth uh, to serve people, uh, to love on people, uh, to be with the hurting, to be with the neglected. He wanted the stories of the hurting and the neglected and the poor to be told. Um, not here. He reminds me every single day I'm not to judge others or I will be judged. Uh, if I want to be forgiven, I must forgive others. I just think it. for me, it's just been such a a burden lifted off my life, knowing that uh, I'm a follower of Jesus and the commands that uh, that He has for me, the direction for my life, if you will. It's it it just has given me a lot of freedom, knowing that no matter what is said about me, no what whatever has done to me, um, I'm to forgive it and get it, give it away. And when I do that, uh, that bitterness that seed of bitterness is not allowed to grow inside of me. And then I can ultimately be the husband and the father that I truly want to be because my legacy on this earth is Marianne, Ashley, Avery, and Robert. That's my team. That's my team. My team's at home. And uh, uh, I know you're wired the exact same way. At the end of the day, we want to be called husband and we want to be called father uh, to our children. And, um, you know, so that's, again, I'd rather be persecuted for who I am than praised for somebody I'm, I'm not. Mm -hmm. Those aren't the words that I came up with. But, you know, I heard a, a, a pastor probably 30 years ago um, challenge us, you know, with those types of words. And, um, you know, I've, I've always felt that's, you know, that's, that's who I want to be. I'm just going to be who I am. And, and, um, I'm not trying to please man. Uh, again, my team's at home, and uh, I just want to be a follower of Jesus. And I think when you're following something or somebody like that, uh, you have a chance to do some very impactful things as a leader. Anyone who's a person of faith, whether it be a Christian or, or whatever faith we're talking about, and there have been multiple different faiths represented on this series, and I'm thankful for that. Anyone who is a person of faith knows, I think, how far they are able to showcase his or her faith in their work environment specifically. Um, when they come to work, if they're able to openly go out to lunch and pray over lunch with a person they go to work with or, or something like that, or whatever the religious observance is going to be or faithful observance at work, you have a very hope, high profile situation. Um, what, is, what is your ability to use that faith look like in a day-to-day -day basis on your job? I mean, people know you for that, you lead with that, but what does that look like in a, when you come in and, and run a baseball team? What does that look like? Well, first of all, I think Jesus is the greatest competitor the world has ever seen. He competes every single day um, for us, uh, sacrificed his life for us, he was persecuted. And he, he, he could have changed all of that. 
He could have had a much simpler path in life if he chose to. And so I, I want to, I know that I've got to compete every single day for the love, admiration, and respect of my wife and my children. I've got to compete every single day for the love and the respect uh, of the people I work with, the people in this community, um, everybody that I associate with. I simply just want to be an encourager uh, to others. My faith allows me to do that. I I'm not ashamed of that. I can't do that by myself, Taylor. Trust me. I'm as jacked up and I deal with the same things that everybody else does. And with many of the hurts and, 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 and uh, you know, some of the, I'm a fighter by nature. Uh, I want to win. Um, but I've learned that I've got to compete the right way. And when you, the, what that means is you compete for everybody else and instead of yourself. And, and, and as I said before, you know, some people ask me all the time about uh, how do you motivate others? And I, I think there's certainly different ways, but for me, I found that really the only way to truly motivate others is to encourage them and to continue to believe in them uh, and believe in them over and over and over, even when they don't believe in themselves and they continue to fail. You got to come up with new ways to encourage them, speak the truth, but you can speak the truth in a very encouraging and uplifting way uh, that inspires people. I can't do that by myself. Um, uh, again, I'm a follower of Jesus, and Jesus set that example. And how many times does he forgive us? Over and over and over. We serve a God who, who gives us multiple chances. And I'm thankful for that because I need multiple chances in life. Um, if, if I'm going to, 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 you know, fulfill the things that I want to fulfill and just have peace in my life, I have to get, I have to have multiple chances if I'm, if I'm going to have that daily peace in my life. You've been a GM now for more than a decade with the Royals, but you haven't always been a GM in baseball. You've been a scout, you've been a coach, you've worked for other teams. Um, have you has the ability that you have to use or showcase your faith changed at all for you as you've walked your way up when you were, when your title wasn't general manager, when you weren't the boss of the team, when you had smaller jobs or when you were a player, were you always able to be as open with your faith as you are? Or has that been tempered along the way? It's been tempered along the way. Um, you know, there's times I wish I would have spoke out a little bit more and, and, um, you know, I, I think our, our oldest daughter, Ashley, is getting ready to go out on the mission field full time in September, and she's going to be moving out of the country. And she's going to be faced with a lot of different things. And, and so I've been studying a lot about missionaries and what they do and, and some of the persecution um, that they endure. Um, and I look at, you know, places around the world like China and and other places in, in, in the continent of Africa where Christians are just persecuted and murdered. And, and a lot of people, not only Christians, but Muslims as well. I mean, there's so many Muslims being murdered in China and put in concentration camps in China. Um, and so I, I often wonder if I would really have the courage to speak my faith in, in some of those environments. And, um, I hope I would, but I, I just simply don't know. Um, you know, like all of us, you know, we're trying to get better every single day. Uh, we're trying to grow in our faith. We want to be better today and tomorrow than we were yesterday. Uh, I've found the only way to truly do that is to seek help, um, you know, from the studies and the management methods of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. That's, that's how I've chosen to do it. And as I said before, it's given me great freedom and peace uh, in this journey. When I make mistakes, uh, when I go through times of trouble, and it also reminds me that when we do have success, um, that uh, it's a great blessing and I don't deserve it. Other people have helped. Most of the time, uh, Jesus saved me from me because I wanted to do things in my own power. And even when I made decisions without his guidance through prayer, 
it worked out anyway. And when I trace it back and look, I mean, I, I realized that, you know what, he kind of saved me for me. Yeah. He kind of helped me along the way. And I, I don't deserve a lot of the success, you know, that, that I, we've had a lot of people have helped. So it just reminds you, you know, one thing that, that I do know, I believe obviously in good and evil. And when you have a great day or you're doing exact, doing really, really well, evil tells you the following. He tells you how smart you are, how gifted you are, how talented you are, how you deserve all of this credit. You deserve a raise. You should, you should, they should write articles and tell stories about you. You're really, really good at what you do. You didn't need anybody else. That's what evil tells you. It's a lie. It's a lie. And that brings out ego. That brings out selfishness. And nobody wants to be around selfish, egotistical people who are consumed with themselves. And then when you fail and you have a tough day, and let's face it, when we put our pet, head on the pillow at night, very rarely are we able to reflect back and say, boy, everything went great today. No, we experience challenges. And the challenges of life are not getting easier for you and I and everybody else. But when you do fail, evil tells you you're not very good. They were right about you. You didn't go from the right to the right school. You don't have the right education. You didn't come from the right family. Um, yeah, all those mistakes you made, you're paying for them right now. You deserve everything that you're getting, all the failure. You know, that's just the way it is. You're just going to be a regular old nobody in this world. I mean, that's what evil tells you. And it couldn't be any further from the truth. And so what does Jesus tell us? Jesus says, when you do have success, share it with others, thank others, be humble, be kind. And that I can honestly tell you, that is success worth living when you're enjoying success genuinely with everybody else around you, there's no bigger reward. And then when you do fail, Jesus tells me, you're learning from this. You're getting better. This challenge is for your growth. Be thankful for this. And so without those teachings, without the gospels uh, reminding us and teaching us, I mean, I, I don't know how I would do it. I've done a couple dozen episodes on this series. We started this last year during the, I guess, kind of the height of the pandemic. And I, so I've been um, open about my faith through this. I was raised in the Church of Christ. I continue to be a member of the Church of Christ um, and I've talked about that. So I say that to share this story. Uh, this was almost 15 years ago. I went out to learn, uh, lunch with a colleague of mine who I outranked uh, at the station that I worked for. Uh, it was just he and I. And we sat down for lunch and... I did not pray over our meal or offer to pray over our meal because I didn't want to make him uncomfortable. And I was getting ready to pick up my utensils. And he said, do you mind if I pray over our lunch? And I, I'll never forget that moment. And I remember thinking that was a real miss that I had there. You referenced there at the beginning of that last question I asked you, sometimes you could have been more open. Do you, can you remember a, a moment like that in your career where you went, I could have been more open about my faith and I chose not to there. And I was wrong to do that. Yeah. I mean, I've been in that exact same situation, Taylor. I've been in that exact same, same situation that, that you described. And, um, you know, I've been thankful for those individuals that have stepped up in courage and, and, um, and led in that way. And it's reminded me the importance of, of leading and just, again, being transparent with, with who I am. Um, but again, I, I'm, I'm remind, I'm not going to beat myself up on that. I'm just going to try to give it away. I'm going to try to get better. Uh, I'm going to try to move forward in a, in a more uh, positive way, making sure that I am following and, and, and being thankful for, for what we have and what we've been given. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, I mean, that happens to me truthfully on a daily basis. I mean, uh, you get so wrapped up in, the competitive nature of, of this job and the, and this, uh, the, the um, demands of this job. I mean, it's 24 seven, it's 360 plus days a year. Um, 
full transparency. Um, I'm watching our game last night. I'm listening to an interview um, by another general manager as he's talking about his team. And I'm also uh, reading uh, articles at the same time. And my wife, Mary Ann, is watching the game with me and she's wanting to talk about things. <laughs> you know, she just gets up and, and walks out. And um, um, I didn't see her until I went to bed that night, last night, and uh, asked her, you know, I knew something was wrong. And so we talked about it and I blew it. My wife was sitting there wanting to talk to me while we were watching the game. And you weren't present. And talk about her day. And yeah. that's driving a wedge. So I'm allowing things to drive a wedge between my wife and I. And that's a day and a moment I'll never get back. And I'm quite certain the day I take my last breath or the day she takes her last breath, I hope I'm not on this earth when she takes her last breath. I don't know if I have the courage to, and the toughness to live life without her, but I'm going to regret those moments. I'm going to regret not having that time together. So um, I blew it. And as much as I tried to make light of it today and last night and be fun with it, and it's just something I'm not going to get back, but I'm, I'm thankful that, um, Mary Ann's faith is real to her and, you know, we've already gotten past that and, um, you know, we've got plans to, to do something tonight together and I've got yeah. a chance to do better. Yeah. You just described not necessarily mundane because we're all, we're not doing that with the same regard that you are, but I think a lot of people who may listen to this can put themselves in that same situation. You just described where they come home from work. They are watching the Royals game. They're also reading something on social media and doing another thing, kind of what you just described, and also ignoring a family member. Um, what about the things that happen in baseball? And I, I, you know, I, I would imagine you've got story upon story that you couldn't share, but what about the things that happen in baseball that are challenges, that are distractions to you or to other people around you that those of us that are not in it just can't fathom, whether it be traveling on a road trip for the number of days that you're going to be around and being around people that maybe, you know, you shouldn't put yourself around or whatever that may be. There's got to be some challenges inherent to professional sports that the rest of us really could never know about unless we were there. Well, you know, Taylor, I'm not sure. I mean, I think we're all, we're all faced with a lot of different challenges and, and um, unique circumstances that weigh on us that put us in an uncomfortable or awkward situation. Uh, you know, I've been dealing with 16 to 25 year olds my entire professional life. Right. You mentioned, you know, this is my uh, 27th or 28th year in professional baseball. Five years prior to being in professional baseball, I was a college coach. Uh, and so, I mean, you can do the math, 32, 33 years of working with 16 to 25 year olds. And so you're going to deal with, um, you know, a lot of emotions, a lot of impulsiveness, a lot of irrational behavior. Uh, you're dealing with professional athletes who um, are, are very committed. Um, you know, they're, they're stubborn at times. Uh, it's it's got to be, you know, their way. Um, and, you know, you're constantly trying to take those personalities and mold it into a team. Uh, because in a market like ours in Kansas City, we have to put together a group of people that really care deeply about the success of others. If we're going to win over 162, we're not going to have a lot of stars in our market. The economics of baseball are different than the other sports. And so, you know, we have to make sure that we bring in people that are, are selfless and, and want to win for one another. And so that creates a lot of different challenges. Um, you know, one of the best things that we did is we created a, uh, uh, a leadership development department here in Kansas City. Matt Morosco, who is our baseball chapel leader, is leading that department with and Reggie Sanders and Mike Sweeney and uh, Willie Akins and Blaine Boyer are part of this team. And they spend countless hours of uh, roaming the minor leagues and interacting with our players and talking about, you know, what it means to be uh, a man what it means to be a professional baseball player 
they share the mistakes that they've made and other mistakes others have made so we can learn from them. We try to be very proactive with a lot of things that we, we talk about. We talk about the things that young, young players and young men deal with, everything from the harmful effects of pornography to uh, proper relationships between uh, and how to treat women and, and people of the opposite sex. Uh, we talk about, you know, um, you know, some of the, the things you know, our behavioral science department is dealing, it helps deal with a lot of the things that kids and, and young people are dealing with pressure and, and uh, some of the uh, mental uh, behavioral issues, the anxiety and sleeping disorders and depress, depression and, and uh, a lot of things uh, that, that we all deal with. And so, you know, we look at this as an environment where we're really trying to just uh, grow and raise up leaders. And so we get in the weeds of a lot of different things here with the Royals. It's different than other organizations. The world obviously judges you based on wins and losses. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we get that. We understand that. Um, but our purpose and our mission has always been much deeper than that. It always has been. When when I was overseeing scouting and player development with the Braves, we had this approach. We've taken this exact same approach here uh, to Kansas City. Uh, we're trying to de develop uh, men and husbands and fathers and great brothers and great sons and great teammates. And, and I think baseball is an unbelievable vehicle and platform to teach all those leadership skills that's going to be required to be successful in those areas. So it's, it's just much bigger than, than winning games. And I really believe that, um, you know, that's, that's our overall mission and the winning will take care of itself. We're raising up another great group of young kids um, that are going to be special to watch here in Kansas city. Uh, that's why we've chosen to stay here in Kansas city. Taylor is because uh, we get a chance to do it this way. Um, ownership has allowed us to do it this way. They believe in our division and our, our vision and how we're raising up uh, these young men uh, to be leaders. And I just think it's so it's going to it's so impactful when it works, when it works and when it clicks, it's it's life changing for a lot of people. And uh, it takes time to do that. It takes energy. It takes sacrifice. It takes understanding. Uh, in patience to do it the way uh, that we do it. But when it does work and it comes together, it's impactful and meaningful and life-changing. And um, you know, that's, that's how we've chosen to do it. You bring up that, that rubber meets the road kind of thought process a little bit that you're judging wins and losses. And that's going to be, you know, I, I, I've, I've, I've made some attempts during the course of this interview to equate your job to others, but there are some places where you just can't. The world, the world judges us on wins right. and losses. Right. That. That's what I was going to say. We all have our own wins and losses at work, right. whether it be 162 or not. But I want to ask this, um, that, that idea of, of where success, the worldly idea of success has to happen in some cases. Would you, do you think you'd still be able to do it the way you just described if you didn't have a World Series ring on your finger, if you had not had the success here to say this way works, you mentioned it's a smaller market franchise and, and sports fans know that just doesn't happen very often for smaller market franchises, especially in baseball where it's not as equitable as some of the other sports. If you didn't have the ring on your finger, would, would you still be able to do it the way you like to do it? Good question. Um, it, it's hard for me to answer that. I, I, I couldn't do it any other way because look, I've learned a long time ago, and if, if there's any measure of success that I've had, it's because I really believe um, that, and again, it's not me, it's, it's being a follower of Jesus. We've, we've really, for the most part, desired and wanted the exact same thing for other people's children as we wanted for Ashley, Avery, and Robert or they're all, everybody's a child of God. Everybody has value. Everybody has worth. Everybody has a future that can be one with full of hope and love and fulfillment. And it is all there. 
uh, for the asking and, and to be a follower of Jesus. And so that's, again, that's how we've chosen uh, to do it. And uh, whether it's in baseball or, or something else, I mean, that's, that's how we have to go about our lives. And so what we've tried to do, Taylor, is just simply one family at a time, uh, one player at a time. Uh, there are so many players that we've had a chance to impact uh, you know, with, with the way we've done things that you've never even heard about, but are doing unbelievable things in their community and their great husbands. I mean, I got a, a text today from a former player who's running a business now, and he's going to be in Kansas city with some clients and he, he wants to meet up and, and nobody would even know his name except mm. people in his community. And so those yeah. are the things that are, are making a difference. And so, um, I, I don't know if we'd be able to do it or not. And I'm really not tied to that because I've been real, I've been happy in every job I've ever had in baseball. I was happy as a volunteer coach. I was happy as a, a paid college coach. I was happy as an area scout. I was really happy doing international work, uh, traveling all over the world where baseball is played. Uh, I was happy as a farm director, a scouting director, a personnel guy, a G I mean, wherever, I mean, I'm, I've been I've been happy in, in every job that we've had uh, in this game. And so I don't have to be a general manager to impact people. When you walk on the elevator, when you get on an elevator in the morning and you greet somebody with a smile and an encouraging word, you're motivating them. You're helping them. Uh, when you speak positivity and life in somebody and again, encouraging words, you're making people better. You don't have to be a general manager of a baseball team to do that. Um, everything, I own nothing. I deserve nothing. Uh, Jesus has given me everything and I deserve nothing. And uh, everything that I have belongs to him. Our children belong to him. Um, I'm simply, uh, as scripture tells us, I'm simply a vapor. And um, a very, very short window of opportunity uh, to live on this earth. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. I'm going to forget about yesterday, good or bad. Spiritual success from yesterday does not guarantee spiritual success today. Financial success yesterday does not guarantee financial success today. Relational success yesterday does not guarantee relational success today. Again, you've got to work for it every single day. You've got to compete every single day for the love, admiration, and respect of the people you care about, your family, your wife, uh, and you've got to be renewed and fresh uh, to be able to fight that battle every single day. And it is a, a battle that is worth fighting uh, for not only our children, but the future generations uh, you know, of, of our country. What about the opposite side of the coin? Have you had any instances that you can think of where a, a player said, I don't want to play for Dayton Moore because he's, I've heard that he's this kind of, he's, he's too clean or whatever kind of, I, I want to be able to live my life and not live under those parameters. Have you had another GM say, I don't really deal with Dayton? Not, not, not to me, but you know what, but, but see, that's the biggest misconception. So like, we take we we want players who who have had issues in their lives. I mean, we're not we're not pushing a player away because they haven't had uh, they haven't they weren't grown up they didn't grow up in the faith or or they have a different belief or or you know they're struggling with whether um, you know whatever people struggle. I mean, we're not judging people. We're here yeah. to uh, first of all, it's about it's about your ability to play baseball. We've never traded a player based on their faith. We've never acquired a player based on their faith. Certainly character is a big part of it, but there's a lot of people with great character and great moral judgment that don't have a faith walk. And that's, okay. that's not my, that's not me. That's, that's up to them. I'm not judging that whatsoever. My, I'm going to love people and care about people. And, um, and that's again, as a follower of Jesus, I'm directed not to judge others based on who they are, mistakes they've made. Um, do I evaluate, uh, you know, what I believe is right and wrong? Of course. But it's not, 
trust me when I tell you, uh, we have a heart for those who are struggling. We have a heart for those who are hurting. We have a heart for those who have a difference of opinion, whether it be political, whether it be how they choose to live their life. We have a great heart for, for them. Um, some of my closest friends have different political beliefs and different moral standards. And I'm not, I, I, I love them. I yeah. love them. And, um, you know, that's, again, that's so much freedom in that. As a follower of Jesus, when I'm to love my neighbor as myself, it doesn't say love your neighbor uh, because they have the same sexual orientation of you. It doesn't say love my neighbor because, um, you know, they uh, go to the same church as you. No, it says just love them and be there for them and don't judge them regardless of how they, what their worldview is. Right. They have a completely different worldview. But that's, that's my issue to deal with if I'm judging them. That's not their issue. That's my issue in life. Pull back the curtain a little bit for me. Just faith in, in baseball. Not, not yours necessarily specifically, but what, what kind of acts of different people's faiths or the way that they worship or the way that they showcase their faith, even if it's not Christianity, whatever kind of faith a person carries in professional baseball that you see as you go around the league, as you visit other teams, you talk to other people, what, what, do, you, what do you see as people let their faith out a little bit uh, in professional sports? Because we see players cross themselves after or before a, a home run or before a plate appearance or point up at the sky after a home run or something like that. But I think we all kind of wonder, what's that look like? Maybe sometimes whenever the camera's not on, what's it look like? Well, I think, I think professional athletes and people of faith um, deal with the same things that, you know, ordinary people deal with or people that don't have a faith walk. I mean, we're all, we're all experiencing most of the same things in life, maybe just at different times in our life. And we're all going to experience many of the same hurts and many of the same doubts, and we're going to have our share of successes and our share of failures along the way. We're going to have people that have believed in us and people who haven't believed in us. We're going to have people that have spoken harsh words to us and condemned us and wanted us to fail. And we're going to have other people that believed in us and we don't know how they believed in us. Um, but the professional athletes and people of faith make the exact same mistakes as everybody else. It's if you relate it to baseball, the mistakes that kids make in little league and the youth level, it's the same mistakes they make out here on the major leagues every single, every single night. They make a lot of the same mistakes. It's just a little more consistently successful. They make the mistakes a little less often at the major, but they're this at the major league level, but they're the same type of mistakes. And men and women of faith, regardless of where they are, they can be a very mature uh, believer in their faith or an infant in their faith walk. And we're all kind of dealing with the exact same things. Uh, and we're all, we all have those, those demons, if you will, that kind of creep in. And, um, uh, you know, and that's, that's the, the beauty of, um, you know, what we're going to experience when we're no longer breathing on this earth. I mean, we're going to be free from that. I believe that those that are, that have a faith in Christ and have acknowledged what Christ came to this earth to do and the sacrifice he made for us uh, on Calvary, followers of, of those gospels and that belief uh, are going to be relieved someday because of, uh, relieved of those burdens, because of not what they did, not because they were great people, but because they simply just believed in the gospels of, of Jesus. And so there's just great freedom in that for me. I couldn't imagine trying to navigate through life without that. Far from perfect, I make as many mistakes as anybody else. I'm still trying to control my tongue in ways that are honoring of God. Um, you know, that's something that I've been dealing with my entire life. You know, I'm really, really good at never ever saying uh, a cuss word and then with spring training <laughs> thinking about them. And then when the games begin, sometimes they come out and I've got to be quick to ask for forgiveness. Say, look, 
that's just not how you conduct yourself. So I'm, I'm in process with all that as well, Taylor. I've got as many issues as anybody else. And I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions of, of, of people of faith is that they're, they're supposed to be perfect. People look at them like, you know, they should be perfect. They act. No, it's just the opposite. Look, I've got scars. I've got wounds. I've got things I'm dealing with like everybody else. I need people's forgiveness. I need people's grace. Um, and, um, but I've got to be quick to own that, you know, when I do make those mistakes as well. So I'm familiar with that. I think every time I swing a golf club, I'm familiar with that phenomenon too. So I, I can, I can put myself there with you for a second. You've been so gracious with your time. The last thing I want to ask you about before I let you go this morning is the idea of pressure. Um, there are literally thousands of Royals fans, not just in Kansas city, but out there all across the country and across the world. Um, there may be one or two or 10 listening to this one as we put this out that hasn't agreed with a thing, a move you've made in the last five seasons and can't, I, Dave Moore's got to go. Tell me about, as you, as you sit there at your desk in your office, um, how you, how you feel it, how you process it. I, I know you probably put immense pressure on yourself to do the job correctly. And there are people above you, Mr. Sherman or whoever else in the organization that puts a certain amount of pressure on you. This is what we're hoping to do. These are our goals. But when there are that many thousands of people that you can probably feel and hear at a stadium on a given night, how do you, how do you process that, that level of pressure? Well, as I said earlier, this is what I've been doing since I was a little boy. Yeah. Uh, I, I just really love uh, working in baseball. Uh, I think it's a great blessing to do something that you've been doing your entire life. Uh, as I also mentioned, my team's at home. Uh, I know that uh, we're not going to please everybody. I've also learned, Taylor, that if everybody had the exact same information that I had, they'd probably do very similar things. Hmm. There's, there's a lot of things that you just can't execute because of a lot of different things. I mean, a lot of different circumstances. And uh, uh, it's just like when we won in 15, you know, we made deals at the deadline. Well, Ben Zobers happened to be available. The year before he was not. Right. John, Johnny Cueto happened to be available. The year before he was not. And so you can only take advantage of the opportunities that are available to you. And you mentioned before, the economics of the game uh, are really challenging in baseball. The Dodgers can make as many moves as they want. We get right. The Yankees can make as many moves as they want. And so that doesn't mean we can't do better and we shouldn't strive to do better. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I understand frustration. Uh, I think Mr. Glass used to say all the time, expectations drive results. We should have high expectations. Uh, we should expect the win every single year. But at the end of the day, I, I don't – I don't value myself or value any player or any person based on how they perform at their job as a player. I had a conversation with one of our players three, three mornings ago, and I reminded him, this organization, Dayton Moore, do not va I do not value you based on how you're performing on the baseball field. Okay, we just simply do not. And if anybody does, shame on them critical eye, critical spirit. I give it away. If they're looking at me with the criticals, I give that away every single day. I'm not going to please man. It's going to be impossible for me to be able to do that. And that's why, again, you've got to follow something that is going to, that you believe in, that you trust, that you will die for. And at the end of the day, as I said before, I'm a follower of Jesus and there's just such uh, relief and freedom in that, uh, because I know I don't have to be perfect. I know I can't be perfect, even though my human nature, my human condition, and the way I was brought up, I'm trying to be perfect all the time, but I'm reminded that I simply cannot. And when I do fail, I give it away. I'm transparent about it. We we admit our mistakes and, and we move on. And um, But again, at the end of the day, father, husband, that's my most important role. That's but that's rare, I, though, right? For I mean, some of these players coming from other teams, that must have told you before, 
I've been told something very different if when I'm in a O for whatever slump in another I, squad. I, I hear that. I hear that. I hear that. And, and and sometimes the criticism that we that we receive is we're not as tough. We're not as hard on guys. Um, you know, we we we're not as transactional as we need to be. You know, the model will tell you that a market like ours should be a lot more transactional. In fact, we should be one of the more transactional teams in baseball because we're in a small market and we're, we're simply uh, not, we're not one of the more transactional teams in baseball. But again, we believe that we get a group of people together, we grow together, we learn together, uh, we, we fail together, we learn from our failure together, we continue to get better together. When you ultimately win, it is so rewarding because we did it the right way and we persevered. You know, when I, when I met with our team in, in October 16th of 2014, I met with our team in the clubhouse and I said, congratulations, guys. You're going to the World Series for the first time in 29 years. We're proud of that. I said, but what I'm most proud of is you guys did it the right way. When you were struggling and the fans were getting to boo you and the media was was on you pretty hard, you didn't lash out. You didn't alibi. You stayed together. In fact, you became closer together. You worked harder. You put your head down and you went to work. You did it the right way. You didn't complain. You didn't make excuses. You just went out and played together and supported one another. And by doing that, you've set an unbelievable example of, of how to be humble and how to do it the right way. And you're being rewarded for that. And uh, you've inspired young boys and young girls and fans all across the world that follow baseball, uh, the importance of just doing things the right way. And um, that's, that's ultimately, I've got a picture of John Wooden in my office and, you know, John Wooden always would talk about the, you measure success based on the effort you give and giving your best. And, you know, I can honestly tell you that uh, we try very hard to give our best effort every single day for the good of our players, the good of the organization, the good of baseball, and certainly representing Kansas City. And at the end of the day, when our time is done here, uh, I want people to say that we treated people with kindness, uh, we cared about people, and uh, hopefully we, we inspired young people to follow this game, and we grew the game in our community, and we represented baseball the right way. Dayton Moore, general manager of the Kansas City Royals. Dayton, I, I can't thank you enough for your time this morning. Thank you so, so much for being on this episode of Faith in KC. Thank you. You bet, Taylor. You bet.